and um, our team really. Uh, it's uh, uh, really uh, very, very uh, special for us. Uh, what uh, we would do is that uh, right away tell you uh, that uh, the award really belongs uh, to uh, wonderfully large number of wonderfully bright uh, people who have uh, uh, provided uh, the creativity, imagination, hard work and all that uh, over the last many years. Uh, and initially when I was told that I had to talk about 20 minutes of this, I said that, well, I can just spend one minute talking about uh, one student. But then suddenly I realized that uh, we had a lot more than that, so we could not have done that. So uh, I thank them. And then I also want to thank uh, some of our uh, really uh, wonderful and uh, bright uh, colleagues uh, from the variety of departments, but especially uh, my colleague from uh, Electrical Engineering Department, Dr. Bhaskar Rao, uh, who has been uh, a collaborator for the last 15 years, and his specialty is uh, digital signal processing uh, and machine learning. Uh, uh, then uh, Professor Hal Tashler, uh, he is from Perceptual Psychology, and he works on attention. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Jim Holland and Ed Hutchins from Cognitive Science Department, uh, who work for Distributed Cognition Systems. Uh, Arvind Bohr, uh, our uh, 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 representative from Holland. Uh, Arvind has been a very active player in human-centered design for a long time. Uh, uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, uh, who was uh, on a sabbatical when some of these things we started working on. Uh, finally, the thanks that I must give uh, is to the generous uh, and continuous support uh, by a variety of uh, agencies uh, which really allowed uh, our students and us to uh, work on this exciting area. So when I started thinking about how to present this particular community some of the things that we've done, so I thought uh, I will talk about uh, some of the people who are in some sense uh, my predecessors. Uh, uh, Professor Boreya uh, was given this particular award a few years ago and uh, he is a great inspiration, uh, a friend uh, and a mentor to me personally. And many of you already know that I mean, uh, he was the person uh, who was uh, very active uh, in the Intelligent Highways program. Uh, maybe he knows about the big demonstration, many of you, uh, that he was involved in and some others were involved uh, in 1997 in San Diego where a platoon of cars uh, were shown to move around uh, autonomously. And uh, the whole idea was again uh, to have the sensorized uh, vehicles as well as uh, infrastructure to make this thing happen. Unfortunately, uh, we, we were fortunately or unfortunately we were part of that particular activity. We were aware of it. We are right next to that particular test site. Uh, but then I started realizing something interesting that uh, after 1997, I would get probably a total of six calls uh, at different times uh, and meetings uh, from our friends from Caltrans uh, and they said that uh, we want to give you a wonderful facility which is about the acre, all real life, uh, but really we don't see any use for it. Uh, and it turned out that that particular project slowly disappeared. So it's something that you start thinking why it would be the case uh, and then uh, to describe what was going on, let Professor Maria speak. You eliminate the driver. So, what is that? Because most of the mistakes and the jams and so forth are caused by driver behavior. We know a lot of social science which tries to modify driver behavior, and so this is a radical proposal, which is you modify the driver behavior by eliminating the driver. So, the notion is you go driver is not needed. hands off, feet off, brains off driver. Right? You are getting the picture and that is about 10 years after that was done and uh, Professor Varaya has seen this particular presentation that I had made somewhere else so he is aware where I am coming from. The other one is something that Andrew knows, uh, another colleague and a friend of mine that, who also won this particular award a few years ago that you are aware of. I am very confident at some point during my lifetime we are going to see that's cars that's Sebastian uh, Thrun. in my car that says bring me home to my garage and fall asleep it's going to drive me home and it will be better off because every year in this nation we kill something like 42,000 people in traffic accidents, mostly because of human error. If we can make cars safer, if we can drive themselves, we can make blind people drive, we can make old people drive, otherwise couldn't drive anymore, children, 
for me, when I'm fatigued or, God forbid, had a beer too much after a night in the pub, um, I think there's so many benefits of this technology, it's going to be really great to have. You got the picture. And so, obviously, these are landmark studies and their contributions have been very well recognized all over the world and especially in our particular community. So if that is the case, that fully autonomous traffic on highways and urban streets have been shown, have been talked about and will be talked about even in the, the classes that I teach, uh, are there some issues that we may want to think about? Uh, so we do believe uh, that there are several outstanding issues and I think Andrew was probably touching upon some of those things regarding technology, the robustness of systems and all that. True. But I wanted to give some other list also that there are social, regulatory, legal and economical issues. So I think we all understand that. But something which is probably not talked about but that is the elephant in the room is this particular issue that sometimes we need to be aware of. That if we want these particular devices or systems or robots, uh, do we really think that humans who are the ones who are going to buy them and use them really want to leave that completely to the robot to do that? And if he refuses to interact, to, to not interact with the system when things are uh, really going to be difficult, uh, we might, as it was told, humans would be getting the labor, <clears throat> the weakest link in the system that failed a beautiful technology. And that is really, in some sense, the motivator for some things that we are doing for the last 15 years or so. Now, let me change it a little bit, a remark that I would like to make. That understanding human behavior is very important for humans to do. I would also like to suggest that that is part of the intelligence that has evolved into us, that we have become more understanding of each other. It may very well be that understanding human behavior might be essential for the robotic systems. And finally, we may actually want to think about these two systems not as those who are going to fight with one another, but really think about a distributed cognitive intelligent system where they share what is that they perceive, what, how they control, how they plan and all that in a very a uh, harmonious manner so that a mutually beneficial goal is achieved. But really, intelligence is not only in the humans or only in the cars, but it is distributed, is the framework in which we want to study this. And to put it all together, uh, we were fortunate that about 2001 2 we were able to put together this lab which we call Laboratory for Intelligent and Safe Automobiles. Uh, where we set this agenda for us and the whole idea was that this is going to be human-centered research where we want to have a complete contextual information derived which involves humans, vehicles and surround and then try to learn are there certain predictive patterns which can be brought out so that bad things would be minimized, good, safe, comfortable things would be easier to occur. And uh, one thing, uh, the, one of the first studies that we had done was a project with the Mercedes. The initial LISA research began with a simple hypothesis that conversations between a driver and passenger in the car are safer than if the driver were talking on a cell phone because the passenger knows traffic conditions and the state of the driver so he or she can modulate the conversation or even stop talking if conditions are risky. Funded by Daimler Chrysler and a UC Discovery grant in 2001, the research aimed to see if it would be possible to monitor the driver's state and convey it to outside callers with whom they were speaking. Inside the lab, researchers equipped a Mercedes test frame with a variety of cameras and other sensors to monitor the driver's facial expressions and other parameters. Here's an uh, example of the driver face effect uh, recognition system 
working, and it's actually a real-time system that we've built. Um, Joel McCall and other researchers developed the system to continuously monitor the state of the driver using pattern recognition to analyze different moods and convey the information instantly to the outside caller. Sending the actual video would take up too much bandwidth, so instead researchers developed emoticons that could change in real time and require... You get the picture. That particular thing, we didn't even have a car at that time, but Mercedes sent us a chassis of a S-Class vehicle in our lab, and we started just playing with it. One thing led to another, we were able to show that these kinds of things can be done, and we started doing things with panoramic vision cameras, uh, and started realizing that with one single camera, we could, understand, we, we could capture behavioral information of a human driver along with the passengers, as well as the surround information. And then that was captured and analyzed by humans. But then we were really interested in saying that can that kind of information be used for doing this human-centered driver assistance system or not? And to do that, I think basically the goal is that we have to go to a destination when we are driving a car. Mm -hmm. and we need to do that thing comfortably. We need to do it safely. And in doing that, uh, basically there are different levels of planning that we need to consider. And these are things which are going to happen at a very short uh, duration versus those things which may happen on a strategic level where you might not have gotten into the car, but you are figuring out what is the plan that you need to use to get there. And that really pursued a study where we said that if we could succeed in this, then we would actually be able to come up with a system which would be able to predict the intent of a driver for doing certain types of uh, 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 maneuvers that they would like to do. And that would be a very important information for the robotic intelligence to have in order to help you be safe. And the whole idea was that the preparatory moves that we are going to be making, even subconsciously, are those that a machine intelligence system might be able to pick up, learn basically by observing, and then it would be able to come up with some kind of a engine, which will always be monitoring this thing on a continuous basis, and then we'll keep track of this little motorcycle or a bicycle that Andrew talked about. Uh, if that is something that the driver hasn't seen, and it can also analyze that and keep your, keep us safe. So I'm going to skip over some of these things, but basically this was a, what we like to call driving ethnography study, influenced really by Ed Hutchins's landmark work 30 years ago, or what is known as I mean uh, cognition in the wild. That is a very famous bestseller, and it allowed us to put together a variety of sensors and we develop certain things. And this is a video that I'm going to see for the first time with you because it was prepared just For few more than a decade, the University of California, San Diego has helped pioneer a new paradigm in automotive engineering with a vision of human-centered, holistic driver safety. What are those things that we can do from the technology point of view of developing new types of sensing systems, architectures, uh, as well as interfaces? Uh, which would allow us to do that is our job. Professor Mohan Trivedi leads UCSD's Laboratory for Intelligent and Safe Automobiles, and the lab has established novel R&D programs with some of the largest automakers in the world, including Nissan, Toyota, Mercedes, Volkswagen, and Audi. They have funded a series of projects that, taken together, have resulted in a new framework that Trivedi calls LILO, short for looking in, looking out, using a diversity of sensors and computer vision algorithms to monitor the environment in and around the car, including the status of the driver. Case in point, the UCSD researchers developed a system which automatically and correctly can predict a driver's intent to change lanes, his intent to overtake another vehicle, or to merge safely and smoothly a full two seconds before the driver actually makes the move. The system effectively learns telltale signs of the individual driver, including when and how he looks into the mirror to judge whether a car may get in the way of changing lanes. The system was part of a project with VW, then in 2009 its sister company, Audi, turned to Professor Trivedi and his team with a new challenge focused on driving in the world's biggest cities. How do we develop uh, 
safer, comfortable, uh, convenient uh, systems uh, so that uh, uh, drivers would really drive in urban areas uh, without getting too much stressed. And what are those things that we can develop in terms of intelligent systems uh, which would assist the driver, especially as they maneuver through urban traffic? The result, a three-year Audi Urban Intelligent Assist initiative announced in January 2011. Audi provided funding to research teams at USC, UC Berkeley, and the University of California, San Diego. We have to worry about uh, intersections uh, where there would be not only other vehicles, but there can be pedestrians, there can be bicyclists, the traffic densities are different and all. Changing lanes and merging result in uh, more accidents than a lot of other maneuvers on the road. UC San Diego researchers used a late model Audi equipped with a top of the line variety of sensors, LiDAR laser scanners front and back, each providing high resolution, real time scans offering nearly 360 degrees of coverage, side radar systems, and a set of cameras for computer vision of the surrounding environment. In late September, Audi briefed the news media in Los Angeles on the outcomes of the Audi Intelligent Urban Assist Project. UCSD demonstrated its two main applications, one to let the car brake if there is an impending fender bender and the driver is not paying attention. The other to let the car give the driver guidance on when to merge into another lane and at what speed to minimize the chances of an accident. What we have come out with is a computational and mathematical framework for computing not just whether a person can merge, but when and how to merge. There's a lot of uh, computation that goes on under the hood, but the driver sees a very simplified icon in the heads-up display, which indicates a desired speed and has a red, yellow, green color coding for whether the maneuver is okay to execute. The distributed camera set up for computer vision can also be used inside the car to keep track of whether the driver is alert or distracted, the second application that UC San Diego researchers develop for Audi. And we can uh, understand that the driver is distracted and can even take over uh, car's control to automatically apply brakes or uh, even give some warning to driver. Tawari successfully demonstrated the system on a campus roadway, having a test VW in front stop with a PhD student pretending to pay attention to his cell phone, and the car automatically applied the brake so that the Audi stopped just short of the stationary VW. We could see that, uh, that the car can also understand its dynamics and apply necessary steps to prevent any accidents or collisions. We feel that we have reached a pretty good uh, milestone. Uh, we are both inside looking <coughs> attention monitoring system as well as outside looking uh, uh, situation criticality assessment, especially for developing merge navigation recommendations. Those are working quite reliably. And they're. All right. Uh, so, uh, gives you a feeling of how things stand uh, as of last week. Uh, we are also keeping on working on different things, so one of the things which is very hard. So, can we look at other parts of the body? Uh, Eshan has been looking at uh, activities performed by drivers. Uh, uh, I must say that I mean, he has developed a very robust system, uh, uh, and even in the computer vision community, now that is considered to be a really state of the art, and now we are using multiple versions of that uh, for doing. Uh, uh, hand activity analysis very robust. Another thing that we can also think about, uh, talking about people who are uh, handicapped in a certain way, uh, and this thing that we hear about, that sometimes people do miss application of the pedal, or they have acceleration which is unintended, but if that is the case, uh, are there things that we can monitor inside the car, like the movement of the foot, and develop really a foot gesture analysis system which would allow us to start predicting when the certain the movement is going to lead towards the accelerator or a brake and if it is going towards an accelerator when they are supposed to be braking your vehicle would realize it 
about 300 milliseconds before it really happens and will automatically stop. So, and so these kinds of things uh, are possible by observing uh, the inside and the outside of the car and uh, we really think that there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, this is really scratching the surface. I'm delighted uh, how much interest uh, has gotten into these kinds of driver assistance systems now uh, at conferences like ours. Uh, and uh, I really think that uh, prediction is very difficult. Uh, but I really believe that 7 billion of us are not going to just one fine morning, five years from now, decide that we really don't want to have anything to do with the cars which are really beautiful and highly automated. We really want to live in the world where both of us distribute our cognitive intelligent capabilities and coexist. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time to entertain one or two questions.